Thanks for coming along from the break. Um, so I guess we've got about 55 minutes to do it, at the most. Um, and I'll use 25 of that or 20 of that or something like that. Yeah. So it's, it's, I get a lot of, I've done a lot of media stuff in the last while because there's two big topics that everyone wants an economist to comment on. And I'm often the only one who's silly enough to do so. And the most important one, of course, is the Rugby World Cup. So I have a lot of action on that. I have a TV crew from France, TV5 in France, interviewing me last Friday on that. The reason I asked about that is that um, a few months ago, the minister and some others were making some pretty big claims about the economic benefits of the Rugby World Cup, uh, which I, and it turns out, most other card-carrying economists who aren't being paid to speak in kind of nonsense, and I said so. Uh, it was a bit shocking, and I'm still being asked about that. Um, I've got my alibi that I am I'm a rugby fan, but I'm just saying we shouldn't do it for the money, because there's no money. Let's do it for the fun. Okay, well, that is fun. Um, the global financial crisis isn't so much fun. And I suppose the most reasonable people are a more serious issue, and that's what I'll talk a bit about. Um, I'm sure I'll, learn, I'll know more about it at the end of this hour than I do now through your questions. We'll get to that. Um, I guess as a, as a, since we're in university, we can talk about our disciplines. Uh, it's an economic issue, the global financial crisis, and it's a real mess, the different crisis. And you might say, well, how come the economists have sort of this sort of thing up? Why don't we keep having these crises? Um, and I've, I've thought about that sort of thing a lot in my 30 odd years as an economist. But I think I've got a pretty good answer. The reason is that economics is extremely hard. <laughs> it's, it's much harder, for example, than classical physics. Now, we tend to think of physics as a tough subject. But in physics, or at least Newtonian or classical physics, is an easier subject to study than science. Because you're, like, you're studying these little atoms and they're whirling around and, and they're quite tricky, but once you've figured out something about how they operate, you can put that in the bank. It's not going to change next month or next year or next decade. Once you to uncover the laws of at least classical physics, I know there's the Heisenberg principle about observing something changes, but sort of the physics that we need to run our everyday lives quite adequately, um, then you've got something, and you can do as Newton, the great, one, you know, one of the, perhaps the greatest physicists of all, said 400 years ago that the reason he can see so far is he is standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, so, and gosh, he said that, and he was a huge giant himself. So physicists, the physic, the physicists just build on top of each other what they've learned before, and they make progress. Well, economics is not about that, like that, because the atoms of economics are atoms and people, the agents as we call them, you know, the, the, the fundamental unit, the people making decisions, are the sentient human beings. And their laws, they, they, have, re, they have their reasons and they have their regularities and they have their all sorts of things, but you, you can't even, even predict, watching them behave and trying to understand how they behave is difficult enough because uh, we uh, can, as Walter Whitman once said, do I contradict myself? Very well, I contradict myself. I am a man, I contain multitudes, uh, which atoms contain perhaps fewer multitudes. But even more than that, once you think you have figured out something about how humans behave, say, in the economy, and then you do something about it, then I guess the old sort of um, Heisenberg thing really comes into hurt you. Once you intervene in, the, in the, the part of human life that is the economy, you change it, and you may actually change the way that people behave. And then, you have, and then you get what you could call unintended consequences. Now this, if you look at the last hundred years of the history of economic thought, the history of economics, the history of economies, this has happened about perhaps four times now. And, and let's, let's say modern history, sort of say late, 20, late 19th century onwards. Um, so modern economics really got going, I suppose, from about 1870 was the first globalization era. We're now in the second globalization era. 
from 1817 till 1913, really, when the First World War broke out. And then you had uh, the, 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 the dominant idea then was, the theoretical idea, was free trade. That you know, markets were good between people, hey, well, they'd be even better between nations. So that period, like four or five years, was a period of breaking down of trade barriers, which was very considerable in the Western world. Uh, everybody had 30% tariffs and things on manufacturing on boards. Downies came, upward trade, financial trade also increased a lot, and the world supposedly became, uh, well, did become a more um, a richer and hopefully better place. Okay, well, that was all good, and they thought the you know, economists had figured out how to run the world, you just open it all up, and free markets, off, off you go. Um, but then something bad happened, which was basically, I guess, came out of the First World War, particularly, um, and probably out of the globalization of the free markets a bit too. We had a Wall Street slump in 1929. Um, uh, we had inadequate, uh, well, we, 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 hadn't really, we didn't really come out of the First World War very well. There was still unemployment around. And we suddenly saw an, un, an unintended consequence of globalization, which was contagion. That if, you, if the world's all joined up, then if a, a bad thing that happens in one country, which in the 19th century would to a large extent have stayed in that country, it might have been bad, but it probably stayed there, could whisk around the world. And worse than that, you had um, governments in the 90s, so we had the Great Depression, which was the, uh, the worst global depression I think that there'd ever been. Um, that's, unfortunately, it still is. It's, uh, it's part of the story. So we had the world, each economy in the world tanking and unemployment going up. What do they do? They said, oh my gosh, um, we'd better look after ourselves. And we, this is all about this globalization. We'd better start putting tariffs up again and beggar thy neighbor policies and, and try and protect our industries. Well, that, as we now know, with the wisdom of hindsight, was precisely the wrong thing to do because it made it worse. Our, one country's, our imports from one country, of course, are their exports. So by restricting them, we restricted the income of other countries, and then they couldn't buy more of our stuff, and it, 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 made, it multiplied the bad impact of all that. And the 1930s were a long period of pretty dismal economic conditions in the whole rich Western world. Double digit unemployment, sometimes as high as 15 or 20 percent. So, whoops, new problem, you know, world, world depression. What do we do about it? Well, the great the greatest 20th century and, and so far 21st century economist, John Maynard Keynes, um, set his mind to this. And, and he, he, with a little help from Adolf Hitler, on the practical side of things, uh, figured out what needed to be done. What needed to be done was that governments should be willing to step in and stabilize the economy. That was the word. Uh, he said, you know, if the private sector is uh, is too frightened to do things and to, and to invest and to give people jobs and stuff, then, and, and so spending falls and people lose their jobs, then the government should step in and, at least in the short run, replace that in with uh, print money, if you like, or we'll just put people to work building dams or building roads or whatever, useful stuff for possible. And that will restore our purchasing power people and then they'll go out and spend that money and then that'll give private sector jobs to people as well. And maybe we can get the economy um, A down to a lower unemployment rate and B keep it, which is the thing. Well people didn't Keynes came up with this great book, The General Theory, in nineteen thirty five, I think. It was a sensation, but it, it was, took a while to settle in. It was only really within the Second World War got going. And Rearmament took place and unemployment disappeared sort of in six months in most of the Western countries. And people also realized that Hitler had actually got rid of unemployment, lowered it a lot in Germany by 1931 with his own Keynesian program of rearmament and road building and public works. That, hey, this, actually, this theory actually works. So Keynes died in 1946, but his legacy was the Western governments said, we're not going to let this sort of depression happen again simply because we're too frightened to act and step in. We will stabilize the economy if necessary. What followed then? So, right, we figured this out. Um, it is a, the government does have a role to intervene. It, it wasn't, I don't know if I have to say this, but Keynes was not a big government person at all. He was talking about the days when 15% uh, of government, uh, 
GDP of the government spending meant you're at war, probably. You know, 10% was more normal. But he said, you know, don't, I'm not a socialist. He wanted to save capitalism. The way to save it is to allow it to work in a stable environment. So people took this on, and off we went. Into what? Well, we went into what turned out to be the golden age of economic growth in the West, in the rich, you know, developed countries. 25 years, ending about 72, 73, where unprecedentedly high economic growth, with about 2% a year per person. Which, when you compound that out, you get a regime shift. You get, by the end of that period, a whole generation, a whole, whole new, whole, sorry, classes and cohorts of people moving from working class to middle class, and moving from pretty frugal middle class to reasonably prosperous middle class by the, by the end, by the 70s. And so, great, we solved that problem. You know, Keynes, Keynes and economics uh, solved the uh, depression problem. But, created another problem. Something happened because we had those 50, uh, 25 years or a quarter of a century of unprecedented, that's the point, it hadn't ever happened before, high growth when there were a few recessions, but there was no recession, basically incomes sort of went up every year, and unemployment stayed low. Went up and down a bit, but it stayed reasonably low for 25 years. People, the little atoms in the economy started to change their behavior. What did they do? They started to believe that this would carry on forever, and so that emboldened them to what? Spend the other Sorry? Oh, sorry. They started spending. Is well, they were spending, all right. But then I thought, why don't we spend a bit more? Hey, let's ask for some more. Let's put our wages up. Let's put our prices up a bit. Life is good. And if, if we overdo it, the government will bail us out. Uh, we don't, the racial memory, as it really was, of say, my parents' generation, who grew up in the Depression, where the real fear was, was slumps and unemployment and losing your job or going bankrupt if you were a firm, if you probably, that had gone because it hadn't happened for 25 years. You know, Keynes had sold that. Brilliant. So they started to push wages up and prices up. And the tw that 25 year period, looking back on it, is the first period in human history. In the world recorded history, and history of the West, if you like, and world recorded history, where prices went up every year. Every year, inflation was positive. In the past, prices used to fall in the slums quite a lot. Um, in the 1930s, most asset prices had fallen, and I was down in Monica a couple of weeks ago, when I'm in Monica, I read the Target Daily Times, which is ODT or something sort of to the oddity by readers, because you do get some odd things in it. I opened it up, and there was this big headline saying, New Zealand general wage order, all wages to be cut by 10%. I thought, oh my gosh. And I looked at it, and in fact, it was, they have this thing like, what, um, they go back um, to 1933, 1931, I suppose. They go back uh, 80 years and look at the target any times then. It was a real shock even to me, you know, as a professional economist, that it actually happened. Wages were cut by 10%. Of course, it was a totally wrong thing to do from a Keynesian perspective, because it cut spending power, but, and they didn't know about Keynes then. No, so, but so for the, for after the war, we had this period where prices always went up, so people said, oh, I'll, I'll go a bit further. Next year, everyone else is going to get a wage increase. We'll go 8% instead of 6 And prices started to move up. And they started to move up quite a lot. And that became a new problem, inflation. And that allowed the anti-Keynesians, the monetarists, who had always been working around, Milton Friedman and his like, to say, ha, you know, you can't buy your way or state to prosperity forever. Government can't run the economy. The economy, the fundamentals are still there. And furthermore, you're destroying the economy with this um, over full employment policy. We've got to hit inflation on that. Well, they did. In the, in the early 80s, early 80s, late 80s, uh, all around the world, uh, governments introduced tough monetary policies, Reserve Bank Act in New Zealand, saying the main priority now is to hit inflation on this. That's our new problem we've got to deal with. And they did deal with it very severely. Created unemployment again uh, and a few other things. But they stabilized the monetary structure. And we haven't had severe inflation ever since then, in the last quarter century. And slowly, the unemployment was a bit higher, but slowly the, 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 the rest of the economy got going again. Plus, people said, let's do the globalization thing again. We've sort of forgotten about that for 50 years. Let's get that going again, and let's start linking up. And we had this new stabilization era called the Great Moderation. Or if you heard uh, my colleague, Prasanna Guy's inaugural lecture last week, what he called the NICE era, from the late 80s, or through the 90s, into the start of the 
the new millennium. NICE meaning no inflation, continual expansion. A nice acronym. Um, people got confident about that. And they said, they're not going to be inflation and stuff. Things are going to be good forever now. We've sorted that problem out. Maybe we've got a little too much unemployment. But it's not high, really. Um, what, what, where can we make some money? What's going to happen? Ah, asset prices. The stock market is going to keep going up, and housing prices are going to keep going up. So let's, let's put our money there. So we had a new uh, thing which never happened before for a long period of time. We had sustained asset bubble boom. Or turned out to be a bubble. And, and we also had with globalization, serious globalization this time, right? and microeconomic deregulation, all those things that came in on the back of the monetarists government getting out of micro-regulation, sort of a free market, go free for all, and, and not, so, not so much in trade stuff that was there, but in terms of financial and, and uh, markets and banks and finance companies and stuff like that. So suddenly they invented all these things called derivatives and, and credit default swaps, whatever they're called, CDCs and CDIs, and all these wonderful financial products, which were nothing in themselves, but pieces of virtual paper but which enabled people in this new globalized economy to start trading assets with each other. And off that went. And, and what no one had realized is there weren't people doing this. There was nothing to stop them. There was not very good regulation. And the assets they could be trading could be complete junk, literally. Uh, but no one would know. Or who would care? Who would, even, who would even mind? And so then that led us to the latest of our problems, along with another thing which is we'll probably talk about in the questions, which is the widening of the income distribution remains our biggest problem now. Uh, the, so the banking, you know, the, the rich sector, rich people going crazy uh, and squeezing the poor and their lower incomes. But we ended up with this um, subprime mortgage crisis in the United States, which was the business of people, subprime means a subprime person, someone who has no or little income, no or little assets, and no or bad credit history, being lent a whole bunch of money, maybe as much as 100%, to buy a house. And in the olden days, that couldn't happen because the only person you could borrow, lend the, sorry, borrow the money from would, would be your local bank, and your local bank wouldn't lend it to you because they look at your credit record and your income and stuff and say, oh, you're going to own this mortgage now. Um, we don't think you can pay it back, so no, save more for your deposit or whatever. But the banks now could say, okay, we'll, we'll sell you the mortgage, we'll give you the mortgage, and then we'll quickly on sell it, or repackage it with a bunch of other mortgages, and sell it on as a, as a financial product to Wall Street, who may sell it on to people in New Zealand or something, then who cares? Yeah, sure, you can have your mortgage. Well, that bubble burst, among a few, and a few other things, and we, of course we had the financial crisis of four years ago. Subprime mortgages, contagion, the new contagion of, of not so much of, of exports and a slump, but of the collapse in the financial markets buzzing around the world. What happened then? And we're getting up to the present now. Well, thanks to Keynes, thanks to Keynes, uh, the central bankers of the world and the finance ministers stepped in, as they have done ever since the Second World War, and acted in a concerted way. You know, they knew that you have to, you can't panic and, and, and sort of try and escape from this thing. You have to act in a concerted way. And we had the bailouts and stuff. You can certainly argue about the bailouts and, and when you just throw you know, good taxpayers' money to to bad banks who you shouldn't have got in the first place. You but you could argue about that, you probably should. But it, it stopped what otherwise would have been a much worse, I think, financial crunch than the Great Depression was, much worse than the Great Depression, than the Wall Street crash in 1929, from becoming a major depression so far. You know, we've had recession, we've had bad economic times in the West, but thanks to coordinated action, they don't like being called Keynesians, these central bankers, but they all are. They all say, let's get together and do something about it together. It's coordination, that's what Keynes said. Thanks to that, plus, of course, one of the other new factors in the world, which is the great, the Asian economies are booming along now, and we never had that before, and they're sort of keeping us all afloat. Thanks to that, they prevented the, uh, so far, and I think probably the, uh, the first global financial crisis, Mark 1, of 2008, from becoming the global slump. Mark two, global depression mark two. So that and we seem to be pulling out of that a year or so ago. Now we've had another blip, which is what? Well of course it's the um, the, the, the situation now with the Euro, Euro crisis and stuff, which I think is where we end up I'll end up talking about. 
Um, but it's not so much subprime people now, or it's subprime countries. Countries like Greece, the pink so-called, Portugal, um, Ireland slash Italy, Greece and Spain, um, who, who, who turn out themselves to be sort of bad risk, bad credit risk and stuff. But what's going on there? Well, um, it goes back to the solving the inflation problem thing that I mentioned. One of the things that they came up with in the 90s to, to stop inflation from ever being a problem again is to stop one of the causes of inflation, which is central get banks printing money. In other words, to stop irresponsible monetary policy from, from, lo from local banks, like our Reserve Bank. Not that our Reserve Bank did it, but um, say, well, we, we'll, we'll do that. We'll tie their hands. We'll all join together in this great U currency union called the European Currency Union, the e ECU. We'll have one sort of central central bank that's completely independent, and we'll have one currency, and then um, national banks won't be able to print money anymore. So they'll be disciplined. They won't be able to create inflation. Excellent problem solved. Plus, we'll make trade costs lower and stuff like that. Everyone, including me, thought this was quite a smart idea. Um, would do that. But again, we, we, we underestimated the capacity of humans to respond to changes in, in their world with something we had forecast. Um, there's a cautionary cartoon from the New Yorker that I show my classes on this, which is a couple of guys sitting in an office, perhaps on Wall Street or somewhere, one of them saying to the other, um, these new regulations are going to totally change the way we get around them. <laughs> and that's, that's, the little atoms of physics never think like that. They don't get together and change the way that we, we're converting you know, one form of energy into another. They just they just do what we expect them to do. But the atoms of the economy respond and figure out what to do. In this case, the badly behaved atoms were the governments of countries like Greece and probably Italy and Portugal and Spain as well. They said, OK, we can't print money anymore, but we can borrow it really cheap from the Germans. We're in the same thing the currency you now, so that we can get the cheapest money that there is in Europe, so that's from German banks at 2% or something. So instead of doing that beastly thing which our, our citizens hate, taxing them to run our government services and our budget, we won't tax them, we'll just borrow the money from the Germans and we'll use that to uh, pay our know, employment and civil service and everything else. So you had, I haven't used the word moral hazard, but it's often used in this case, you had the same lack of incentives for a subprime uh, house owner in, in mid, mid, Midwestern America to pay their, not pay their mortgage and they could walk away from it. The Greeks, could, the Greeks it seems, could walk away from their debt, or could they? What do you do about it? So the, the current euro crisis is still not resolved, maybe still to get worse. I think there's solving this latest problem, which is the governments who not only can print money and behave badly, but if they can borrow money, who needs to print it? You just borrow it and then you can default and not pay it back. And there we are now with the, the, the economists of the world puzzling about what do you do about that. Okay, so that's the lay. The tightening of monetary, monetary policy in the 1980s seems to have been associated um, with, the, with the change in the tax rates in, in, in the sense of the marginal tax rates coming down for the highest earning people. I, I saw an op-ed by Warren Buffett in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago yeah. in which he wrote that uh, he never ever saw any um, um, investor decide to invest less on the, on, on the back of increased um, um, tax rates. No. Well, it, 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 they weren't particularly linked those two things, except sort of since it's that sort of the upper classes like sound money. They like they don't like inflation because it makes them nervous. But um, but they, they certainly happen at the same time. They're certainly linked by the neoliberal foundations. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you know, sound money is sort of a, almost a, an ideological thing from a certain perspective, and don't tax the rich is certainly an ideological thing, yeah. and that's. If you ask, if you say that the, the euro crisis has happened, is not in the eurozone, it's in Britain, and it's what happened in the riots here two, three weeks ago, and how much does that to do with this widening of the income distribution, mm -hmm. which, um, which an important part is, um, at least in America, Britain, and in this country, uh, letting the rich off the hook on taxes, then I think you'd be right. Yeah. And Buffett, you know, a few of these, and in, in this country, um, uh, the, the trade being guy, um, what's his name, Sam Morgan. You know, a few of the people who've sort of created their wealth by just being really clever at doing things. 
They don't really do it for the money, they do it for the fun of it. Um, like Buffett and Sam Morgan and even um, Bill Gates, I suppose, say, let's give it back, we should be taxed more. And you don't get too many of the CEOs of the merchant banks saying that. So I think it's a problem, and I think the, the social, the, the, it's, you can't put everything into one thing, but when that stuff started to happen in London and around Britain, I remember that back in the, in the triumphalist neoliberal heyday of Martin Thatcher, who was even tougher neoliberal than anyone we had in New Zealand, and a guy called Peregrine Morsthorn, who was, as you can tell by his name, from the class he came from, he was, I think he was the editor of the Spectator magazine, someone asked him, said, uh, Mr. Morsthorn, do you think we have a class struggle in England still? And he said, class struggle? Certainly we have a class struggle. And our class is winning. <laughs> well, they did win in the 80s and 90s, but uh, maybe the, the price, maybe it's a perfect victory for Peregrine, you know, that it's coming to come back to haunt me now. No one wants these you know, nasty things to happen, but it is a bad problem. Well, I'm just wondering, from what I've heard, the financial reforms in the US following the crisis weren't particularly thorough in the sense they banned one or two financial products, but most of the I think derivatives were untouched. So do you think there's a chance of the same sort of bubbles repeating? Well, again, yeah. hopefully, it, it doesn't matter what the Americans do, as long as we all, everyone else does something different. In other words, you want to isolate these problems. You know, if Americans had to deal subprime, say, by themselves, American banks, subprime wouldn't have happened in the first place because the, they would have known they, they couldn't on-sell the stuff to people, the rest of the world. So America's a worry. America's such a worry, it's almost not worth worrying about. It's <laughs> 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 so, worrying in so many ways. Um, hopefully, there's, there's all, over the, all over the rest of the world, maybe even the states a bit, the regulators are coming in with what was completely ignored before by central banks, or at least by the public, which was the so-called prudential regulation side of the business. Everyone thought central banks were all about money supply, macroeconomics, but now they realize it's about uh, restrictions on what banks can do or financial companies can do, how much risk they can take, how much backing they have to have for what they do. I think that has improved. Whether it's improved enough, I don't know. But, you know the long run answer, I think, is we're over-globalized. You know, we're, we're too con contagion is too hard to contain because the financial markets are too open to each other. I, I read the other day that in 2007, I think, you know, four years ago, at the start of this thing, and it wasn't the start, it was when we realized it was there, that the value of derivatives, which are these sort of nonsensical products which aren't worth anything themselves, but just sort of assets, owning assets, in the world was something like a quadrillion, trillion, sorry, a quadrillion dollars. A quadrillion, apparently, is almost as big as a zillion, which is like always was like mixed into infinity. Uh, <laughs> a quadrillion is a thousand trillion dollars. Now, that's, that's much bigger than the world economy. So it, it, you don't need all that stuff. It can't be doing any good. It's not like a mortgage on a house, because the value of the houses in the world is not one quadrillion dollars. So it's not helping people buy houses. It's just gambling and flipping things around. And so I think that the, really the, the big four that we've all been, um, that we've all been had laid on us, especially by a lot of economists in the last 25 years, is that um, globalization is good, so more globalization is better. You know, there's a little binary thinking about it. Is if you put up your hand and say, could we have too much globalization? People immediately say, oh, I'll go back to North Korea. You know? <laughs> <laughs> very binary. Yeah. And we should. We should we should be able to ask that question. So but so in your mind there, like what the right level of globalization would be some sort of trade-off between being able to say diffuse risk which might be localized somewhere and and having some sort of systemic risk which would Well yeah, that's what people thought that it would be good for risk because you'd offload it, couldn't you? Yeah sharper markets around the world, better futures and things. And there must be some of that, but the systemic risk turns out to dominate, at least in the last period. But the, uh, the, the waves of risk going through the economy, uh, have the effects of that, the waves of risk by people who don't bear the consequences of being wrong about the risk. That was the problem, the moral hazard problem. I think that's proven itself to be huge. If you do a dynamic computable general equilibrium model, of the benefits of liberalization of anything globally, like free trade or anything, you, you're dealing, you should probably know, because of common, with triangles. You know, after a certain point, once you've opened up the economy a certain amount, further opening up on its small benefits, but if it has any sort of contagion or risk 
increasing effect, then it's probably probably not worth it. Uh, as, you, as you know, um, last year, um, the, the Economist's Dynamite Prize was given to Alan Greenspan as, as being the person most worthy of causing, for, for causing the, the financial crisis. Um, do you believe it was, a, it was a worthy winner? I didn't know that they had done that, the economists. They're very good at being wise after the event, the economists. <laughs> <laughs> For those who haven't picked it up, the Nobel Prize is based on dynamite, so they're just the economists just oh, the dynamite prize. I see, the Nobel Prize. Okay, well... For blowing up the economists. Well, let's just... I don't think, let's, Greenspan was, was uh, sort of blamed for the easy money thing of the great moderation, wasn't he? And he made it very easy, and he made it very easy for these subprime mortgages to be issued and stuff. Um, I don't know if that's fair to Alan Greenspan or not. I think one should bear in mind that Greenspan and President Bush, and I think before Clinton, who were in favour of these things, they, they did have quite a noble sort of goal in mind, which was that of a property owning democracy. And they could see these prices, house prices, going up under their watch. And they said, this may be the last chance for lower income American families to get themselves a house. Right? Because the prices, house prices keep going up 4 or 5% a year, and it comes down, and they would. Then forget it, it will never happen again. So you could sort of say, oh, OK, yeah, maybe we should give people these, these subprime mortgages. And even though they, they haven't got any capital or maybe not have a job, hey, if they get into trouble in, in three years' time, then the house will be worth 20% or 30% more. You just sell the house off and pay them all the job like that. So it may have been irresponsible, but it, someone like Greenspan and the two presidents I mentioned, it was probably well meant. Um, what do you think the roles of um, organizations like the IMF is in, in this crisis? I mean, the people say that they have um, some, somewhat given breaks to or incentivized irresponsible borrowing. Um, what, what do you think about that? The IMF? Yeah. And their role now or in the past? Um, well, their role now. Their role now is probably better than it was in the past. <laughs> they were pretty hard line on the Washington Consensus, which was the, you know, the world version of Rightward genomics or neoliberalism. Um, as far as I can tell, they're, they're, they're going to be a force for, for, for good rather than for bad, I think, in the future. I think. There are chief economists, uh, Olivier Bonchard, right? He's a Keynesian. He's, you know, he's American, he's a French originally, but he's an MIT Keynesian. I, I used to teach when I taught macro before I gave it up as pretty hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> I used to teach from Bonchard the intermediate macro here at Auckland, and, and there were complaints about that because it wasn't a neoclassical Chicago text. So eventually I just quietly gave up. But, uh, but you know, he was a good guy, he was a Keynesian. So he wouldn't have been chief economist at the IMF 25 or 30 years or even 10 years ago. So I'm not, I don't follow the IMF day to day, but um, I, I think we might finally be glad we've got them around. And the World Bank too, they've, they've changed a lot as well. Do you think do you, do you think so? Or are you well, more I, I, no, I just heard that. Uh, I mean, um, I mean, there's been a lot of banter about the the fact that they're kind of giving breaks to to the this kind of irresponsible borrowing, um, and uh, yeah. you know. That's a, well. That's but Europe is not so much an IMF thing, is it? It's more no, no, European. You're, you're right. But, uh, like I mean, any any such organisation that yeah. that does. The, the IMF has always was always been like that. Say in Latin America, which is one of the yeah, yeah, big areas. Exactly. You know, they. they with the countries like Argentina say, well, we're gonna, this is a, we're in a real macroeconomic mess here because we, basically because we're having to find so much money to pay off these loans we, we took from American banks. We, we think, hey, what about we default? And the IMF would come in you know, very hard on them, threatening all sorts of cutoffs and stuff. And then also IMF would go up, across the street in Washington to, to the Treasury Department and say, can you help me? Can you bail it out? Bail it? And of course, who are they bailing out? We weren't bailing out the Argentinians, they were bailing out the Wall Street banks to lend the money. And a real moral hazard issue there. You know. Well, why, why should the same? It comes up right now with the German bank, the private banks have lent money to Greece. They're pretty naughty because they've been thinking, hey, what the heck, these Greeks aren't up to much, but they'll be bailed out, you know, so we'll get our money. So I think that is a real issue. When, when you're bailing out, who are you bailing out? If you're just bailing out lax private sector banks and financing, then that's probably a bad thing. I think we be a bit more cautious about that now. And of course, Argentina, as now talked about, Argentina did default 10 years ago, right, in 2001, didn't it? And, and they also went off, they, they, they pegged their currency to the dollar. It wasn't a currency union, of course, but they pegged it 
But they, and that was one of their problems too, that it was too high and they couldn't export. So they, they stopped pegging it, they devalued their currency, took it away from the dollar and defaulted on their debt. Well, a terrible fuss. They almost got invaded you know, but, uh, by Mrs. Thatcher again. Yeah, <laughs> You know, they, they just said, they just gritted their teeth and said, we're a big sovereign nation, so you know, who are you? You know, I will do what we like. And they carried on doing it. And there's been a big success story the last 10 years. Argentina has been a basket case for 70 years. They're not now. They're, they're, they've still got their problems, but they've done fairly well. They're still apparently frozen out of world financial markets because of their naughtiness and defaulting. But that's probably quite a good thing. <laughs> and apparently, they don't really mind because but the thing they were trying to stop, they weren't, it wasn't paying back debt that was the problem, it was just paying the interest on the debt. So they didn't want to borrow any more. Yeah. They were just being stuck, you know, they didn't want to get a bigger mortgage on their house, they were just having real problems just paying the existing mortgage. So they, by defaulting, I say anyone should default on debt really, but they, they wiped their sort of said, sorry, we can't pay the interest anymore, but we don't want any more money anyway, we'll do it ourselves now. So people, Think like you know maybe Argentina is something that you could learn that the Europeans could learn, but of course the, the, the European Currency Union would have to be broken up. First. Would you say, for example, that that would be the best tack for for the big nations to to take to default and and then kind of work this up? Which, for, man, for, then managed kind of for Greece to default, say. Yeah, for example. And get out, leave the euro, or be thrown out. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to say left. We don't. <laughs> yeah. And then they can devalue their drachma and do, <laughs> do what paying back they do want to do and devalue um, the currency. Yeah. That seems to be the smart thing to do. I mean, the moment they've been told that they have to do fiscal austerity, you know, and cut government <laughs> spending and all this sort of stuff. And that's the same issue that other and most countries are like Britain as well. They're paying less interest anyway, which seems ridiculous to me because if you're a high risk country, then essentially you should be paying more. You, you should have been paying more. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, yeah. It's all a bit sore, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it is a country which could learn a little bit about horizontal equity and tax system. Uh, <laughs> uh, everybody paying the same share, the same level of income, which uh, we've got in New Zealand pretty much. We've got horizontal equity here with the GST in it, even if we don't have vertical. Uh, I, yeah, I, the European Central Bank, however, I believe is, is very hard line on this. They don't want anyone leaving the euro, do they? And they don't want euro bonds, right? This is a, a more technical issue, um, a way around it. Or maybe the Germans don't want euro bonds, the Central Bank does, I'm not sure. Well, Germany's got the biggest say in the ECB. It, it, it goes on voting sheets from how much they can yeah, yeah. to it, isn't it? So, who doesn't want euro bonds in the Germans? Exactly. It's the, those are the, it's the German banks who are the most highly, yeah. uh, uh, who, who own Greek bonds the most, followed by the French yeah, banks. They're the most exposed yeah. yeah. oh, Earlier on at the start of the financial crisis, there, there was a lot of talk about um, the, the imposition of some form of token tax, some sort, some sort of yeah. financial transa transactions tax, yeah. uh, in part because this would um, quash the tendency, like, like you mentioned, to have this Baroque ballooning of CDOs and so forth. Yet it seemed that um, uh, um, the, the, the British government and certainly the Obama administration um, quashed any talk of a financial transactions tax. Do you have anything to say about yeah. that? I, I, the, I think we should have. I think if, if we could, if we could make a financial tax, uh, financial transaction tax, by the way, is a tiny little bit of money, say a quarter of a cent, on a dollar that's moved purely at a financial transaction. It's a little tax on that. It costs country. So if you're moving a dollar into New Zealand to build a factory here and employ people, of course a quarter. You know, you, you, in other words, you're bringing the money in to, to stay and do something useful with it. Or, the, or putting it out, then a quarter of a cent in a, in a dollar is, is nothing. You'd pay quite happily. But if you're putting money into New Zealand, because New Zealand is the tenth most highly um, speculated uh, currency in the world, sugar in your sleep, um, then and you want to pull it out two hours later, having made your tiny little profit, then a quarter of a cent in the dollar is probably more than a profit. So you won't do it. So that's the idea. It's, it's basically to partition off uh, for international financial flows which have some run real meaning to them, which are actually trying to buy something useful or sell something useful, you know, a good or a service. Um, 
from just purely financial flows which exist for their own sake, possibly just for, for, for currency speculation. If you ask responsible people, like say Alan Bolland, Reserve Bank, who I did recently, or friend of my students did recently when we had him in, what about a token tax, financial, uh, financial transaction tax? He just, he, well, he, I think the first thing he said, I think, was that we can't do it in New Zealand. And we can't do it just unilaterally. And then if you say, well, why don't we all do it then? Why doesn't the IMF? Then they say, well, we can't do it all together. Right, people will get around them. I, I don't think it's as bad as that. Some countries have, Chile has done one, of a sort, it's a tax on exports of capital. Um, and it's been very successful there. It's, it, it upset the, the usual suspects, the IMF, everybody else may put it on, but Chile, which is a, a fairly you know, right-wing country in many ways, but they realized that they didn't want to be in play all the time on, on financial markets. They wanted steady, they didn't want to be in, they didn't want, didn't want to be North Korea, they wanted money coming in and money going out, but for useful things, not in and out all the time. So they put one on. I think didn't they extend it last week or something? Um, and in the the Asian crisis of 1997, uh, remember that? Uh, every, when, when various when packs of cards like collapsed like the Bangkok property market, which was over really invested, and it was uh, there were real buildings there, but they were empty. So so there was a speculative sort of bubble burst there. Money started fleeing from these countries, bad effects. One country said we will put a, um, a tax on, we, we actually, put, we actually didn't just, in the short run, they just put actual restrictions on exporting capital out of the country. You know what country that was? It was Malaysia, um, always sort of a country that does its own thing. Uh, again, the IMF and the World Bank and the American uh, State Department were poor, but Asia, uh, sorry, Malaysia apparently, perhaps not just due to this, had the least problem in coming out of the Asian, uh, the Asian financial crisis because they didn't have all the hot money fleeing the country. And hot money was stuck there for a while and so things settled down. So I, so I think it, it's a great idea if it can if it can be made to work, but I'm not a financial expert. Uh, did you have a question, Joel? Oh, yeah. Um, <coughs> do you think like, this sort of widening income distribution phenomenon is um, an Anglo-Saxon thing or is it like a whole Western thing? Or the widening, yeah. it, it's, I hope it's not global, because there's some talk that it's happening in China, but mainly because, I don't know if the poor are getting poorer, but the middle classes and the rich people should see away, but it's, it's global in the Anglo-Saxon economy, it's worldwide in the Anglo-Saxon economy. Uh, it's not so prevalent in continental Europe, I don't think, and I don't think it's prevalent at all in, in Northwestern Europe, in Scandinavia. But it, it's, a, it's a huge, Fact in Britain, United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, and, and, and I suppose Ireland as well. And I think it's just rotten. And it's stupid too, you know, wicked and rotten. What do you do about it? Ah. Why do I put that question up there? I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> what do you reckon we should do about it? Tax the rich, yeah. I mean, don't, don't give them tax breaks. But the rich, have, the rich have always got two people sitting in that room saying, oh, these new taxes are going set, to uh, present us with a whole new way, we need to find a whole new way of getting around them. By okay. the way, how, how is that, um, how, is the, uh, how are those assets calculated? I, I can't work it out whether it's um, measured in terms of annual income or in terms of total assets, you know, when they when people talk about the Gini index and so on. Well, it's, it's whatever you want. I mean, it, it can be, it's both, it can be either of those things. Okay. Um, I think wealth distribution is wide probably more than incomes, but um, in, in, incomes is, is the scary one. Well, they're both scary, but they're both related. The, the income distribution. You see, in, in the great, the golden age, from 47 or so to 1972 of the West, income differential was narrow across the West. So the, the, the rising tide, to use um, Reagan's metaphor, did lift all the boats, but it lifted the little boats more. And of course, tides can't really do, but physics of that doesn't work out. But, but it, it was a period of, of not only of in the average incomes going up, but average incomes going up more at the bottom. And you know, the working classes in our country, 
and in America became middle class, if not country, I probably didn't want to become country middle class, but materially, you know, because of people owned the house, owned the car, owned the fridge, and had a bit of fun in their lives, or at least had the people for them to do it. That's, 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 that's so it could happen, it did happen, uh, but that was, that was, was reversed in the late 70s, in the early 80s, it has been ever since. On the issue of inequality, I've seen it argued that, um, from like Lorenz's case and things, that um, the redistribution doesn't actually have a huge effect on the inequality, and perhaps we should be getting more fundamentals like public investment, education. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. Your redistribution, your redistribution, can you take money from the rich and give it to the poor and stand back and watch that happen forever? No, I, I don't think you can. I think, you know, I, I think it's, we, to me, the role of government is to provide public services, which I'm happy to pay taxes for. And it's, its role in redistributing income, income per se, like giving money to the poor rather than having a good school system or a good health system that everybody, including low income people, can benefit from, is pretty limited because you, you do lose so much on the way past. It's very hard to take money from the rich, they don't want you to. And it's, then, then it, it, it's quite hard to give it to people without a lot of administrative and rent seeking costs along the way. So I, I think, yeah, it's, government as a provider of good services is, is important. Because healthy, well-fed children will become healthy, well-fed, and productive adults. And they won't be sick and unnourished. But to me, it's all about earned income and the getting wages up for jobs, getting people working, and helping, getting someone working in every household they can, and going out to work and earning a good wage, or a good income, and earning their way to I don't think there's any country that's ever done it any other way, except maybe for the, sort of the oil states and things you know, who really have so much money they can't give it away. <laughs> but, that, but to me, I, I'm an old-fashioned um, social democrat or the believer in the wage earners' welfare state. As part of the welfare state, it should be that you know, families can earn enough to look after a lot of their needs, and we'll pay taxes on that, which will be used to I remember that you touched on this in an entirely different way at the um, Auckland Writers and Readers Festival a couple of years ago when you interviewed John Gray. And there I think you, you, you said that it was people in your generation who were able to buy property and see their assets rise, yeah. uh, which meant that the income gap or the asset gap was really uh, essentially a gap between the, not so much the rich and the poor, but between the old and the old and the retired versus the young. Well, who will inherit from the old and retired? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't, well, you remember that case you did the press, but... Um, uh, I was the person who put the sweet in your envelope. Oh, did you? Did you yes. Yeah. I must remember that. Thank you. I do remember you now, yes. That's okay. Professor Hazel know. died wanting bribes to for questions, so I bribed him. <laughs> And you got the question, yeah. And they were having been sweet. So, uh, so I remember this well. I started that off by we were talking about the baby boom generation, which I'm born in 1947. And I said, uh, we're the luck, we, the baby boomers, if we're still alive, and what most of us are, the uh, luckiest generation the world has ever seen before. And I said, we grew up with the pill, and we grow old with the agro. <laughs> Plus, we got, we, we got all the cheap oil and we got all the cheap land and property and stuff. And I said that, we, I think, and I said, I think we're going to be, we're the luckiest, I know we're the luckiest generation so far. We also grew up with modern dentistry and stuff, and John Gray raises eyebrows and so people are always talking about dentistry. So <laughs> that is a huge factor in, in our standard of living in the 20th centuries, or the 21st centuries, is, is good dentistry. Um, all the good doctors. And I said, look, but, but we are the, and when I said, we, I was talking about him too, because he's about the same age as me, and when I said, uh, we got rolled with Viagra, he said, you speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. But I said, but we are the luckiest it's ever going to be as well. And that was, I was really thinking there though, that we've taken, we've got the cheap oil, and we've got the cheap land and stuff like that. Um, but I wasn't so much thinking of intergenerational between, the baby generation parents and grandparents, as we now are, and our children who are going to inherit our houses. You know, we're not taking our houses with us. You know, so, 
uh, maybe the generations that don't start off with someone to bequeath you know, lucky baby boomers. That's, that's perhaps the problem. The generation of young people now whose parents couldn't buy a house because the baby boomers have sort of grabbed them. Maybe that's the issue. And there may be one more question. Um, going back to uh, what you were saying before about the recession, let, let's say that we were to slip back into a recession. Um, what do you think would happen? Because it seems, uh, well, at least in the United States and Europe, with kind of what's going on there, the hands are pretty much tied in terms of any fiscal stimulus. Yeah. Um, well, we, well we, we have slipped back, but we haven't really slipped out of it yet, have we? So no. the, the issue is, I think, is, is I think it's the macroeconomic issue, in terms of what macro, you can do in the macroeconomics, and it's probably mainly macro. I think the micro-regulation of the banks has to go on and be better. But it's, it's pretty clear. You don't destroy your tax base by cutting government spending a lot. You, you make some cuts to government spending, perhaps, but you do, the, you do much more with tax increases. If you, if, if, okay, so you're trying to get out of, a deficit, out of a recession when you've got government deficits because of the bailout three years ago. That's what I should have said that. That's the structural problem. So the hard, the hard line is, and Britain, and then one in Britain, and the United States, the Congress there, say, it's a government deficit that's the problem. So we'll never get out of this unless we crank, you know, we, we eliminate that. I think it's just goofy. And, and all the, I think all the empirical work of macroeconomics says that it's, if you cut, if you increase taxes by a dollar, it has a much smaller effect on spending than if you uh, decrease government spending by a dollar. So if you're worried about the deficit a bit, the, but you're also worried about the recession, the, and you've got to juggle these things, uh, the way to do it, to deal with the deficit without doing so much harm to the recovery, uh, without, without hitting the demand in the economy, is to put the taxes up, at least on higher income groups who have reserves, and go easy on cutting um, benefits or public spending. Do you, would you agree with that? Well, I was thinking maybe something more along the lines of maybe we could inflate our way, or like stimulate aggregate demand through inflation yeah. rather than. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's, that's a technical, so that becomes a technical thing too, which perhaps we'll finish on a boring technical matter. Once, once, we, once you've got quantitative easing, once the central banks have put so much money into the system, interest rates are zero, to try and get people to spend more and get this up, um, what more can you do? You can't have negative interest rates, can you? Yes, you can. Money. You, if you have inflation and, and a zero interest rate, you've got a negative interest rate. So, um, you know, uh, Paul Krugman, for years, has been trying to telling the Japanese to have some inflation, you know, because they're, they're stuck with zero interest rates, as they have a long time, and a, and a sort of a long recession. And he's saying, uh, be irresponsible, be responsibly irresponsible, I think it was the phrase Paul Krugman, the New York Times economist, no what prize would they use. The responsible thing to do is to irresponsibly put some inflation on the system and get people spending. Well, maybe. Should we let the Japanese try it first and see how it works? <laughs> Why, do, why don't the Japanese try it? Uh, because they've got they've got already got a two hundred percent GDP yeah. deficit, isn't it? Well, any Japanese people here who could answer that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's, it's it's just not the Japanese way, perhaps. To be the, J the Japanese and the Germans were never real Keynesians in that sense. They they always were much. They always both experienced hyperinflation after wars, after, you know, serious inflation, which, which we and the rest of the West, the Anglo-Saxon West, never had. So their racial memory was not just of unemployment and war, it was also hyperinflation. And I think they've always been a bit more sort of orthodox on, on those matters as a result. 